Okay, good afternoon friends. Uh, uh, I am Shankar Kumar. I teach history at Hindu College here in Delhi University. Uh, it's the first time that I'm getting to see you on this platform. Uh, I think uh, we uh, went live 15 minutes before but there were some technical, uh, there was some technical hitch or something. Uh, let me just uh, sort it out. Uh, one second. Should I begin? Okay, okay. Fine, so I just got uh, this uh, clearance from the organizers that I can uh, go ahead. Uh, excuse me for that, for uh, the last 15 minutes which uh, had to be deleted. Uh, I had uh, proceeded on with my lecture. Anyways, uh, so we are uh, here to talk about the post Mauryan times. And uh, the post Mauryan times, uh, uh, for uh, lay listeners who are not trained uh, into the discipline of history as such, uh, let me just explain uh, the timeline. We are talking of, uh, say, the period from 2nd century BC or 2nd century before the beginning of the Common Era to around uh, the 3rd uh, century uh, CE third century common era that is uh, we are talking about five centuries uh, that uh, stand uh, sandwiched between the emergence of two iconic uh, empires in early India say the Mauryas to, uh, towards the uh, beginning and towards the end of the post modern period we have the emergence of the Guptas in fact uh, uh, in fact, uh, that is why this particular uh, phase or timeline of Indian history has not been able to acquire an identity of its own and it is usually labeled uh, in political terms as post Maurya or pre-Gupta or something of that sort. But uh, as we would discover eventually uh, as we proceed through the lecture that uh, this period is uh, very formative in terms of quite a few political, social, economic and even religious uh, trends uh, that uh, in fact got instituted uh, into the Indian tradition, followed uh, subsequently across several centuries, across several political changes and some of them even survived till date. Some of the practices uh, that for the first time had been instituted into Indian history in the post modern period survived till date. Just to give you an illustration, uh, you can uh, think of the circular coins that we use and uh, that's something that we are so, uh, so uh, familiar with and uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, the coins in use in India before the pre Mauryan, uh, before the post Mauryan period, were not circular in shape. Uh, they were of uh, uh, no fixed shape as such because they were intrinsic coins. They were silver uh, strips cut into different pieces of different size, usually geometric size, all right, but it was by weight. So there was no practice of using circular coins as such. And it is only with the advent of the Indo-Greeks, uh, say, in this period uh, that we designate as postmodern period, that uh, Indian uh, history took to uh, using uh, circular coins uh, uh, as, as a practice, as a very usual practice. Similarly, uh, even uh, the practice of the political uh, sovereign using a uh, political sovereign uh, uh, taking the responsibility of issuing coins is something uh, as a practice got, uh, th that got instituted only in this period of time. So, if we talk about the Maurya Kaal, we also see that there were different shrenias which are called trade guilds, merchant trade guilds, manufacturers trade guilds. और उनके द्वारा जो है सिक्के हैं वो निर्गत किए जाते थे जिसे हम आहत सिक्के कहते हैं या पंचमान कोइंस कहते हैं तो राजा के द्वारा सिक्के निर्गत कर किए जाने की जो परंपरा है वो पोस्ट मॉरियन काल की परंपरा है और ये भारतीय इतिहास में संस्थागत तरीके से शुरू हो गई थी और उसके पश्चात ये निरंतर आज तक चलती आ रही है सो so, 
coins become an important uh, economic uh, marker of political sovereignty also so this is something which which uh, uh, which uh, comes into being only at around this point of time uh, in indian history uh, so uh, if you if you uh, track several other uh, practices uh, then also we find that uh, quite a few things uh, can be uh, can be studied with reference to having begun in the post modern times and having gone on to continue ever since uh, but this is not only uh, the uh, purpose of today's lecture uh, in fact post modern times also stand uh, stand for uh, giving impetus to quite a few uh, tangents of indian history that were at work uh, from uh, a period uh, before this for example the uh, the issue of urbanization uh, shaharikaran ki jo uh, prakriya shaharikaran chathi shatabdi isapur mein jise hum second urbanization mante hain bhartiya itihas mein uh, presuming that the first urbanization uh, is about the harappan experience and the second wave of urbanization that indian history saw uh, triggers around 6th century bc in north india and most of the towns uh, that emerged in indian history actually emerged at around this point of time in 6th century bc and this process of uh, urbanization and the accompanying intensification of trade commercial activities and agrarian activities manufacturing activity artisanal activities building activities uh sculpturing uh, uh, activities all these uh, practices that had already taken shape uh, indian in this in indian history in an institutionalized way received more philip during this period of time and if you uh, if you track the economic profile of uh, the post modern times in fact you will find that uh, Uh, the material quality of the findings from the post modern times are vastly superior as compared to the earlier period even belong to the modern and pre modern times for example the wattel houses and mud and wattel houses give way to uh, concrete mud uh, uh, concrete uh, um, you know lime and uh, brick uh, burnt brick houses there is increased uh, use of uh, iron nails and so forth the uh, pottery quality uh, is is becoming more and more refined there are more varieties of artisanal activities there is more intensification of agriculture even in frontier uh, even if you look at the agrarian frontier of india Uh, during the modern times in the post modern times you find uh, that agrarian frontiers are all the more increasing to new areas so deccan and uh, several other areas are also undergoing intensification of uh, agriculture so uh, more uses of agrarian tools and agrarian calendar the number of grains that we get to have we have archaeological findings uh, from uh, uh, maharashtra area and they give you a variety of uh, seeds and grains that testify to the fact that uh, the bread basket or the grain basket of india uh, has undergone uh, expansion and this is a this is a trend that had already been triggered in uh, in the period before the uh, post modern times and in the uh, in the uh, in this period that is post modern period it all the more uh, receives philip in fact it reaches its climax so if you compare the urban map of india if you uh, look at the map of india of the post modern times and compare that with what was the uh, uh, urban fraction in the uh, modern period you will find that uh, post modern uh, times give you more number of urban centers so even in deccan and beyond you have more number of uh, urban settlements uh, in the post modern times there are several ports uh, uh, बंदरगाह जिसे कहते हैं वो पहली बार उभर कर भारतीय मानचित्र पर हमें देखने को मिल रहा है तो ये, ये सारे जो परिवर्तन है वो इसी समय हो रहे हैं और आज के लेक्चर में हम कोशिश करेंगे कि इन सबों को एक एक परिप्रेक्ष्य में देखें और जो हिस्टोरियोग्राफी की मेजर इश्यूज हैं हिस्टोरियोग्राफी में जैसे मौर्य काल को कैसे समझा जाता है कितना केंद्रीयकृत था कितना विकेंद्रीयकृत था या केंद्रीयकरण का एक्सटेंट क्या था ऐसे मसलों पर भी जो इंफॉर्मेशन हमें पोस्ट मॉडर्न पीरियड से मिलता है उसका एक सीधा प्रभाव पड़ता है इस तरह के कॉन्सेप्चुअलाइजेशन को बनाने में या इस तरह के नेरेटिव को बनाने में तो मौर्यों की जो मेजर नेरेटिव है 
उसके ऊपर भी एक करेक्टिव के तौर पर इस डिटेल्स को हम यूज कर सकते हैं इसके अलावा हिस्टोरियोग्राफी का जो एक मसला है कि जैसे जब भारतीय स्वाधीनता आंदोलन के समय में जब पोस्टमॉर्डन टाइम्स के बारे में लिखा जा रहा था तो उस समय जो एक आप कह सकते हैं कि एक सोच बनी थी एंड सिंस यू कैनॉट डाइवोर्स हिस्ट्री फ्रॉम दी पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ द टाइम्स इट इज बीइंग रिटन सो दो इश्यूज आर आल्सो देयर एंड प्रोबेबली वी कैन टॉक अबाउट इट टुवर्ड्स द एंड ऑफ द लेक्चर और मे बी इफ देर आर सम क्वेश्चन रेज देन वी कैन एड्रेस दैट बिकॉज इट्स ऑलरेडी अ ट्रंकेटेड लेक्चर because we have already lost around 15 20 minutes uh, towards the beginning uh, and we have to redo this so let's proceed uh, uh, compare uh, visual just visualize uh, the modern map for uh, yourself and uh, compare that with the post modern uh, map uh, that you can think of so uh, modern map would uh, take the dominion of the mauryas up to in the in the northwest up to iran area and uh, in the east up to bengal area and uh, in the in the south uh, up to uh, the uh, barring the peninsular tip uh, that is chol chera pandyas uh, who are uh, referred to as uh, chieftain polities in one of the uh, ashokan inscriptions uh, as the neighboring state so certainly they were not part of the mauryas but uh, all the areas north of it uh, certainly were part of uh, the mauryan empire but the extent and level of uh, control and the economic activity uh, and uh, social and economic differentiation is something uh, that that is uh, that is questioned and debated uh, by the historians now compare that to the uh, post mauryan map and in the post mauryan map you will find that even uh, there are more dots in the deccan area there are more dots uh, in the odisha area there are more dots in maharashtra area there are uh, more dots even in north india so more number of settlements uh, are seen in the post mauryan period all that is symptomatic of something and that is what i refer to by in, uh, by uh, talking about the intensification of quite a few processes that had already triggered in 6th century bc uh, that is the process of urbanization uh, or the uh, expansion of trade commerce uh, network um, uh, the trade routes and the maritime trade for the first time again uh, a very vigorous maritime trade uh, is uh, detected uh, to be to be happening in the post modern times uh, to begin with uh, uh, the focus in historiography was on the western littoral that is uh, from gujarat up to uh, tamil nadu area the western coast of india and we have several ports uh, mentioned in the indo roman uh, texts and uh, subsequently even um, uh, the same uh, indo roman uh, texts also inform us pliny strabo and so forth they also inform us about quite a few uh, important port towns uh, on the coromandel coast and even in bengal so uh, there is uh, there is that issue of hinterland uh, getting integrated uh, through this uh, trade network and uh, how the recent researches have spoken of uh, india leveraging uh, some bit of disturbance uh, in the uh, iran area on account of uh, extortionist policy pursued by those kings there and at that point of time in the post modern period say 1st century bc 1st century ad 1st century 2nd century ad at around this point of time it were the kushans who were ruling um, uh, a significant part of uh, northwest and northern india their uh, their uh, uh, extent uh, extended up to uh, across mathura up to banaras uh, and also the western part of india and central part of india besnagar uh, pillar inscription we all know uh, belongs to uh, heliodorus and so forth so uh, the the sheer fact that uh, kushan uh, are the ones who are uh, at the political helm at around this point of time allowed uh, a kind of you you can say uh, a diverted route uh, which of course was considered more safe Uh, so uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, traditional silk route which emerged from yong in uh, china and uh, passed through central asia across to west asia and ultimately found its way to the mediterranean coast uh, cities 
briefly uh, for these uh, couple of centuries in the post mauryan times uh, took a detour uh, across to the indus area and there it entered the arabian sea and from there you have the ships uh, uh, sailing across to the red sea uh, what we know as uh, erythrean sea peri plus meri erythrae that is uh, the red sea and uh, what we find is that uh, persian gulf which was the epicenter of this uh, maritime trade between uh, asia and uh, uh, the roman world uh, perhaps uh, gave way to uh, this uh, uh, more vigorous uh, maritime intercourse uh, from the red sea to the western uh, uh, littoral areas uh, of indian subcontinent and subsequently connecting with the coromandel coast going across to southeast asia in search of spices in search for several other articles uh, gangetic nard uh, ivory and so forth they are all mentioned in one of the accounts uh, spices are just missed out so uh, it's not as if uh, we were only uh, dealing with them uh, uh, in terms of spices and so forth so Uh, there is a variety of uh, goods and uh, similarly uh, all these uh, trade networks that uh, appear to be very vigorous at around this point of time uh, had a consequence on more critical processes that are internal to indian history and that is the process of state formation तो राज्य व्यवस्था के उदय के ऊपर भी इसका प्रभाव पड़ा क्योंकि जो अधिशेष जो मुनाफा ट्रेड के माध्यम से हो रहा था यहाँ के लोगों को और उससे जो सामाजिक और आर्थिक विभेदीकरण हो रहा था किसी के पास कुछ ज्यादा संसाधन थे किसी के पास कम संसाधन थे और इस विभेदीकरण के फलस्वरूप और जो आंतरिक संसाधन है जैसे जैसा मैंने बताया कि Uh, expanding frontiers of uh, agriculture uh, manufacturing activity so they are also happening simultaneously and all these things are you know making uh, new regions in india uh, uh, more capable of generating more and more resources on a continued basis and eventually sustain a state structure of its own तो जो राज्य व्यवस्था के लिए जो पर्याप्त संसाधन थे वो संसाधन को जनरेट करने की कैपेसिटी अब कई क्षेत्रों में आ गई थी और ये पहली बार इन क्षेत्रों में आ रही है जैसा अगर आप पॉलिटिकल मैप को कंपेयर करें तो आप पाएंगे कि सातवाहन पहली बार पश्चिमी भारत में उनका राजनीतिक उदय हो रहा है पश्चिमी भारत के अगर अगर आप भारत के मैप को देखें भारतीय इतिहास में तो आप पाएंगे कि पहली बार पश्चिमी जो भारत का इलाका है जो आज का महाराष्ट्र है वहां आपको सातवाहन लिखा हुआ नजर आता आता है पोस्ट मॉडर्न टाइम्स से नाउ दिस इज द फर्स्ट इंस्टेंस ऑफ सेकेंडरी स्टेट फॉर्मेशन इन दिस रीजन इन इंडियन हिस्ट्री सिमिलरली उड़ीसा इलाके में आपको पहली बार पोस्ट मॉडर्न टाइम्स में ही खारवेल किंग वहां दिखते हैं ऐसा लिखा होता है पॉलिटिकल मैप से व्हाट डज इट मीन इट मींस इट ट्रांसलेट्स इनटू इमर्जेंस ऑफ दिस रीजन एज अ सेकेंडरी स्टेट फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम इन इंडियन हिस्ट्री सो वी हियर ऑफ दैट आइकॉनिक अशोकन वॉर विथ कलिंग बट आई एम श्योर यू वुड नॉट रिमेंबर द नेम ऑफ द कलिंग रूलर विथ होम अशोक वॉज फाइटिंग एंड several other critical details of the state society if at all kaling was a state society uh, with which uh, ashok was engaging in a war then we have very little evidence so uh, essentially uh, uh, odisha area also emerges into historical phase of uh, early indian history for the first time in post mauryan period and it is revealed only through the hathi gumpha inscription of king kharvel who belonged to mahameg varman dynasty so what are they symptomatic of they are symptomatic of uh, the critical uh, resources and uh, social complexities uh, which are required for the emergence of state society in different regions of any place so in the post mauryan period be it odisha be it uh, maharashtra be it uh, several areas or for that matter uh, 
the Satvahans are also referred to in Puranic records as Andhras. And historians fight whether they actually belonged uh, to Andhra and then moved to Maharashtra or they belonged to Maharashtra and then eventually moved to Andhra. So opinions are divided. But fact of the matter is that be it Maharashtra, be it Andhra, be it Odisha, they emerge into historical phase uh, of Indian history for the first time only in the postmodern period. So these are some of the formative uh, impulses that we detect uh, in the in the postmodern times. And uh, moving to the social domain, if you look at the social domain, so as I told you, the value of the value and the value का जो घनत्व बढ़ रहा है और उससे ज्यादा मुनाफा संभवता हो रहा है और वो परिलक्षित हो रहा है सुधरती हुई जो मटेरियल कल्चर है भौतिक अवस्था है वो बदलती जा रही है और वो बेहतर है एज कंपेयर टू द अर्लियर टाइम्स एंड दैट टेल्स यू दैट देयर कुड बी सेवरल सोशल ग्रुप्स व्हिच वेयर इकोनॉमिकली एंड फाइनेंशियली डूइंग बेटर एंड दे वेयर they were uh, you know adding to their uh, economic uh, status as such and uh, it had its ramification on the caste system it had its ramification on the varna vyavastha and therefore you find several uh, sanskrit texts uh, like manusmriti and several other dharma sutras uh, which tell you about the mixed castes uh, sankarvarna now these are theoretical exercises to accommodate the changed social conditions the changed social uh, dynamics uh, in the postmodern period so uh, in in the place of the conventional four varna now you have several new uh, uh, groups emerging and uh, they had to be accommodated somewhere in the uh, fourfold varna division and therefore you have differing numbers of uh, mixed jatis uh, being referred to in these texts uh, don't uh, uh, don't uh, presume them to be happening exactly the way they are explained in these texts but you should understand the rationale of uh, uh, these texts rather as uh, uh, attributed uh, you know uh, by some people uh, to justify that uh, even in these times the fourfold varna division could adequately uh, explain uh, the uh, hierarchy and diversity uh, of the social uh, scenario in india to is tarah ki complexities aapko dekhne ko milti hai aur ye jo pictureization main aapke samaksh rakh raha hu that is drawn from not only a variety of uh, literary sources the conventional ones and the jataks and uh, buddhist and jain sources but also from archaeology but also from inscriptions so for example you have votive inscriptions now votive inscriptions are uh, uh, you know very many in numbers in in uh, post modern times and uh, uh, they essentially are small donative uh, inscriptions uh, whose records are maintained in some temples in some monasteries in some gateways that uh, they had donated or they had uh, donated some resources uh, for uh, beautification of a particular temple or a stoop and so forth for example the iconic sachi stoop which uh, for the first time of course it was uh, created in the uh, modern times but uh, most of uh, the beautification the uh, the wall around it the uh, gate around it uh, at the at, at the entrance and so forth they were uh, the by product of uh, the post modern times and uh, very uh, very uh, modest uh, economic background people could also now donate now this is something that has to be understood with reference to the changed uh, religious scenario also and therefore uh, the post modern period is also typified by by yet another characteristic feature of uh, this period and that is that across religions you will find across the big religions be it the vedic hinduism be it uh, the uh, uh, buddhism be it uh, jainism they are all undergoing in the post modern times on account of religious dissensions and so forth uh, they are getting divided into smaller sects and for example in uh, uh, buddhism we get to hear of uh, uh, the uh, uh, mahayan and hinayan hinayan representing the orthodox uh, uh, you know continuities and mahayan is little bit 
uh, more uh, uh, adventurous or you can say improvised version of it. Uh, it was preceded by Mahasanghika sect and uh, Chaityaks and so forth. So all these ideas coalesced to give rise to another sect which uh, allowed even the common people of modest uh, economic background to give donations to uh, these uh, religious institutions and uh, therefore feel attached to it. So these are the different mechanisms by which different religions of all persuasions are trying to popularize themselves. The same happens in uh, uh, Jainism. You, you have Shwetambar and Digambar and the same happens uh, even in uh, uh, Vedic Hinduism. And uh, you find from here on in the postmodern times, you find um, uh, on the one hand, uh, you have Vishnuism, the Shivism. Now, if you really decode uh, through the Puranic records uh, as to what it took to uh, uh, what it took for the emergence of these uh, sects, then you will find that there are uh, uh, very uh, small uh, deities or uh, uh, symbols or emblems and over uh, a period of time these deities symbols and for, for example the Vasudev cult for example the Krishna cult so they all get coalesced over a period of time under the Narayan uh, cult of uh, uh, the Vedic times and that is how the canonical uh, pantheon of gods and goddesses get created and uh, the, the same could be uh, seen happening uh, in the case of Shivism. Uh, the Rudra of the Vedic origin uh, sits over or uh, uh, sits, sits over several uh, smaller sects uh, and uh, uh, cultic figures, some of them uh, uh, fertility cults as well, Nandi uh, and, and so forth. So uh, all these things get coalesced and they are brought under the uh, big pantheon of gods and goddesses under the trinity of gods. So the idea of monotheistic trinity of gods uh, like uh, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, they are also born of these times. And the similar trend could be seen, the idea of Bodhisattva. Uh, so uh, all these uh, in, in Buddhism, so all these things uh, uh, seem to be happening or all these things uh, seem to be impacting different religions uh, all at once and this is a trend that we get to see in the postmodern period and uh, eventually uh, it is through these uh, ways and means and apparatus religious apparatus that you find that uh, uh, as the mainstream agrarian society expanded or took into its vortex a majority of the land and uh, populace of India under its fold, they also simultaneously acquire a new religious identities. So the uh, smaller sectarian cultic identities get coalesced into a bigger, uh, you can say, pan-Indian uh, identity religious identity either in the form of buddhism or in the form of uh, jainism or in the form of uh, uh, of uh, hinduism now this is happening perhaps as a result of the uh, dissensions and uh, uh, schisms that are happening in the postmodern times and it is this particular uh, trend that uh, perhaps uh, uh, led to uh, you know, coalescence of these groups into bigger uh, religious uh, pantheon of gods and goddesses. So, uh, all these things are critical for our understanding. And uh, similarly, uh, if you if you uh, uh, track the uh, economic uh, aspect of this period, uh, that is uh, the postmodern period, you will find that uh, uh, apart from the uh, uh, increased prosperity that could be detected uh, in terms of uh, the grants that are being made even by people of uh, modest economic background. So professionals are uh, giving donations. Uh, artisans are giving donations to monasteries and uh, temples and so forth. Now, earlier this was the exclusive preserve of the uh, kings and the ministers uh, and now uh, there is uh, you can say some sense of democratization 
that seems to be happening uh, at around this point of time. So all these things have to be understood in a particular uh, context and that context uh, is something which is weaved or which is uh, revealed in uh, these historiographical uh, debates and so forth. And uh, as we uh, uh, finish detailing these political, economic, social and uh, uh, religious uh, discussion, we would come back uh, to the uh, bigger issues of uh, the historical uh, inquiry uh, in terms of uh, continuity change, in terms of the identity of uh, the Mauryas itself, in terms of the uh, ownership of land, etc. and so forth. For example, I am just uh, giving you an example because uh, it is a truncated lecture, so uh, I am not able to elaborate it fully and it is only through illustrations that I am trying to uh, you know, uh, touch some of these uh, important points. Points. For example, uh, if you look at the records uh, in the postmodern period, uh, if you look at, say, uh, uh, Menander's uh, conversation with uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Buddhist monk uh, at around this point of time, uh, you will find that uh, there is uh, an oblique reference to uh, to uh, while he is uh, talking to Nagasen, uh, it, is, it is referred to that uh, anyone who uh, cultivates the land first uh, is the one who gets to uh, have the ownership. So ownership of land is vested with the person who makes the land fit for cultivation. Now this is, an, uh, this is a practice uh, whose antecedents could be found even in the literary records of Shatapata Brahman and so forth. But that is something that seems to be happening. Similarly, if, if uh, you look at uh, one of the Satvahan uh, inscriptions, then uh, we get uh, this feeling, uh, we get this sense that uh, probably land had uh, uh, or uh, there was a market in land also because the king is buying land from a private individual. So all these things tell you that uh, in contrast to the vast uh, terrains of land and uh, centralized farms, worked by the Das and hired laborers under the Mauryas, the situation that we encounter here in the post mauryan times is individualized private ownership of land. And uh, as I told you uh, towards the beginning of the lecture that, uh, you know, we somehow carry this historical legacy uh, that uh, we tend to, uh, we tend to, uh, you know, uh, supplant our political imagery over economic uh, uh, imagery as well, over over uh, economic uh, scenario as well. So, if we think that postmodern period is the period of smaller polities, we tend to believe that well, economy is also uh, getting fragmented. That's not the case. And if you take it uh, in the reverse direction, if we have indisputable evidence of land ownership being individualized land ownership in the uh, postmodern period. If you take it back, then you can even question the uh, narrative of a uh, very centralized uh, state controlled uh, economy of the Mauryans as well. If you look at R.S. Sharma's uh, uh, stage wise uh, description of uh, ancient Indian economy, uh, what, what he, uh, what he uh, the designation that he uses for the Mauryans is that of state control of production and pan-Indian perspective. Whereas for the post-Mauryan period, he uh, uses the term small farms, money economy and Roman trade. So, uh, but uh, as I told you that uh, if you, if you, uh, if you believe and which is a very, uh, very logical thing to, to, uh, to, to believe, if you believe that uh, economic changes are not coterminous and coextensive with political changes, then you can question uh, these narratives. For example, what I mean here is ki uh, rajnaitik parivartan hone ka matlab yah nahi hota hai ki arth vivastha mein bhi parivartan a jaye. Jaise uh, example ke taur par agar Mughal chale gaye aur Mughal ke baad ka jo kaal hai ya British chale gaye aur British ke baad ka jo bhartiya kaal hai to aisa nahi hai ki rajnaitik parivartan hone ke saath saath 
हमने अपने खान पान में भी परिवर्तन कर दिया हमने अपने उत्पादन की व्यवस्था में भी परिवर्तन कर दिया और हम किस तरह के बर्तन प्रयोग करते थे वो भी हमने बदल दिया तो ऐसा तो होता नहीं है सो इकोनॉमिक चेंजेस हैव देयर ओन रिदम सोशल चेंजेस हैव देयर ओन रिदम एंड दे आर मोर लॉन्ग टर्म दे आर मोर स्लो अकरिंग चेंजेस एज कंपेयर टू एज कंपेयर टू पोलिटिकल चेंजेस विच आर मोर ट्रांसजेंट एंड मोर रैपिड बट समहाउ as a, on account of historiographical slippage it happens that our imagery uh, political imagery which constitutes the dominant imagery gets supplanted over our uh, economic and uh, uh, social imageries also so uh, if you uh, really look at the details of the post modern times you will find that some of these slippages of imagery can be rectified such such dominant images can be busted and uh, this is uh, a very important role that uh, any fruitful inquiry of the post modern period can do similarly uh, if you look at the trade uh, and commercial situation in the post modern period what we find is uh, as i told you that this is one of the uh, instances where uh, the uh, continuity can be seen the uh, trajectory the economic trajectory of change triggered in 6th century bc continues unabated actually it uh, it um, uh, you know it acquired a climax during uh, the uh, post modern times we have more number of urban centers we have more intense uh, trade and commercial activities coins are uh, multiple they are gold coins as i told you that uh, indo Greeks can be credited for that, or Kushans can be credited for that. They are bearing legends. They are bearing dates. They are usually accompanied by portrait of the monarch or important personalities, and they had all become norms. And all these things had greatly facilitated uh, exchange of goods and uh, services and so forth. Trade routes are multiplying. and uh, critically, what happens is that the traditional uh, Silk Road. that uh, emerged from uh, mekong area in china uh, passed through the uh, central asia west asia and ultimately uh, to the mediterranean coast uh, uh, alexandria and so forth reached there uh, so uh, on account of some disturbance uh, in the iran area uh what happens is that since at this point of time kushans are ruling over the northwestern and western part of uh, uh india at this point of time so what happens is that uh, there is uh, some evidence that uh, perhaps as some kind of a uh, diversion uh people uh, or the traders uh, instead of passing through the uh, central asia on account of the extortionist policy of the of the uh, rulers over there they entered the indus delta so they took a detour and entered uh, uh, into the uh, delta area of the indus and thereby uh, entered into the arabian sea and the traditional monopoly that the persian gulf had uh, had uh, uh, enjoyed in the indo uh, in in the roman trade uh, with asia that monopoly seems to be waning and this is something which is uh, very evident in the uh, celebrated uh, discovery of monsoon by the romans and the Gre- greco roman sailors and uh, this is something uh, that gets uh, evidenced at this point of time only in the post modern period only around the beginning of the common era so you have texts like uh, the periplus of the erythrian sea you have strabo you have pliny all these people are writing about a very intense trade uh, and commercial activity uh, that is happening with the western uh, littoral area uh, of the indian coast and uh, through the hinterland trade even the coromandel coast uh, gets uh, sucked into the same network and uh, eventually they found uh, their way to the south east asia uh, from where transactions are happening with reference to spices and so forth and over and beyond that there are several uh, goods of indic uh, uh, make 
for example, gangetic nard, ivory, and so forth, that also are the items that are transacted with the uh, Roman world. So while we have sites like Arika Medu, etc., and we have several uh, coin hoards also uh, uh, found in the peninsular India, which testifies to the reasonably good profit that uh, uh, these polities are having by engaging themselves in this lucrative uh, Indo-Roman trade, it also points to a very critical factor here uh, for the social and for the social and political formation of uh, uh, this area. For example, you will find that uh, the river valleys uh, of uh, the Chol, uh, uh, Pandya, and Chera. So they are all, uh, you know, be it the uh, Vaigai River and so forth. They they are the areas of attraction uh, in the Sangam literature and uh, uh, Kaveri Delta and so forth. And uh, by exercising control over uh, uh, these areas, these chieftain polities uh, tended to, uh, you know, generate more and more resources uh, for uh, further elaboration of their, uh, you know, uh, control uh, mechanism or apparatus. And uh, this is something, uh, of course, it is. it does not uh, continuously go on in the history of South India. Uh, rather, there is some uh, phase uh, which, which is referred to in the text as Kala Bra, and it is eventually around 7th century uh, common era that you find the Pallavas uh, emerging in these areas and subsequently again uh, the Pandyas, Chola, uh, they also emerge in the peninsular India, but the area remains the same. And uh, it, it is the same area which uh, once had been inhabited by these uh, tribal chieftains. And uh, you will do uh, well to note here that uh, right from the Sangam Age, and when we say Sangam Age, basically we are referring to 1st century BC to say 2nd century, 3rd century AD. And even in the Sangam Age, the polity is uh, tribal chieftainship. And yet, just, just think of it, they are... Uh, putting a, a system in place where every uh, uh, where all of these polities are maintaining twin capital system so one capital necessarily has to be inland while the other capital has to be uh, the uh, port area uh, uh, facing the sea and why are they doing this they are, they are obviously they are aware of the uh, advantages occurring from participating in the lucrative indo roman trade and uh, if you uh, look uh, into details of the accounts left by these uh, Indo-Roman uh, sailors, you will find that there are four-legged uh, routes by which uh, you know the trade is happening. And uh, uh, unless they had uh, mastered the uh, uh, art of making sophisticated ships, usually these ships uh, sailed along the coast area and they did not venture into the deep sea for example uh, in the uh, monsoon months uh, obviously uh, these transactions were sub uh, suspended and uh, it uh, began only from uh, the end of august and uh, beginning of september when the southwest monsoon had uh, uh, lost its steam and so uh, that's the time when the ships could travel uh, from the uh, Gulf of Aden to different uh, ports uh, at the uh, uh, Indus Delta, from there to Barigaza, from there to Muziris and so forth. And uh, then um, obviously the Coromandel coast was also uh, brought into the vortex of uh, Southeast Asian uh, trade. So uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, these tendencies reverberate even to the present times and the newly created state of Telangana. Um, I was just, uh, uh, you know, uh, reading some uh, news article which said that uh, they are also thinking of uh, having uh, more than two capitals. Forget two capitals, more than two capitals for for this uh, new state. Now, this is this is not only on account of economic ex exigency, but there is something uh, that is historically bestowed in the uh, culture and tradition of peninsular India where the idea of having twin capitals is something which is which they are very much familiar with. 
so uh, the, uh, this is how structuring happens uh, in history uh, on account of uh, some uh, changes at one particular point of time in history and over a period of time it gets instituted it captures public imagery it, it gets replicated through policies and so forth and some of them uh, quite a few of them actually survive to the uh, pres uh, to the to the uh, present times so uh, that is that is something that uh, i wanted to share with you and i don't know um, uh, so there are quite a few uh, other stuff related to the gandhar art mathura art the sculpturing tradition uh, uh, where uh, you know uh, wonderful things can be noticed for example uh, the hellenistic influence and uh, uh, the same guild of sculptors probably catering to the order uh, to the demands of uh, the uh, brahmanical gods uh, the uh, buddhist icons and the jain tirthankars and therefore you will find uh, some kind of a similarity in the treatment of a sculpturing tradition uh, uh, of uh, gods and goddesses belonging to different uh, religions uh, and this is this is all happening only at this point of time in indian history the post modern period it began at around this uh, period of time and therefore uh, the sculpture of uh, gautama buddha Uh, would uh, appear, uh, you know, uh, of of a make which is certainly different from what a native of Nepal would look like. And uh, have you ever imagined? Have you ever pondered over this as to why this is happening? Of course, uh, if uh, Gautam Buddha was born in Nepal, which we know he was, so he would not appear. Ideally, he would not appear uh, uh, the way he appears in the sculptures, sculptured. you you know uh, presentations of gautam buddh why it is happening it is happening because this sculpturing is itself is getting instituted at this point of time by amalgamation of uh, various traditions and it had uh, it it leaves a distinct stamp of its style on these creations and that is something that uh, you could see uh, across religions uh, similarly the yakshini Uh, tradition of uh, magadh area also had a very formidable influence on uh, the kind of sculpturing that uh, you get to see um, uh, in the mathura art and so forth and the um, kind of uh, uh, finesse with which uh, uh, this uh, depiction is done and so forth that is very much apparent and uh, it it is it is these aspects uh, that provide uh, a kind of uh, identity Uh, of its own uh, to the post modern period and post modern period becomes important for us as i told you that uh, if if you uh, take back our uh, understanding of uh, land ownership to the modern times back in time then our uh, understanding of modern period can be revised similarly uh, uh, you can take it forward to uh, the gupta economy as well and uh, there also you can uh, make these details incident on uh, uh, the feudal debate uh, uh, that uh, keeps several historians engaged uh, in the later and post gupta period so uh, what uh, what the central assertion of this lecture is that uh, the uh, the varied details of the post modern period uh, is not residual in nature it should not be regarded as a period sandwiched between the two iconic empires rather Uh, since the uh, sources are multiple and uh, evidence is very tight therefore uh, the uh, facts acquired uh, from the post gupta period can be very uh, ingeniously used to uh, modify or to uh, rectify or as a some kind of a corrective to several major uh, uh, you can say dominant images that we carry otherwise uh, of different periods of uh, indian history uh, as such so uh, that is it uh, i think uh, it's already nearing 5 and uh, i need to uh, look at the chats and uh, uh, just check if there are questions uh, well uh, let me see if you have left any question second uh, there are 139 people on the way and look at these 
comments stone floating green okay all your questions have you typed questions uh, the viewers have you typed also let me see Organizers, can you help me uh, getting the questions in case there are any? Let me check. Let me check with Ishan in case he has. Okay then, thank you.